Um, just a couple of announcements before we start. Um, there is supposedly Wi-Fi capability. <laughs> We're not sure if it works, but we do have a login and password. Um, it's taped up to the wall, so try it and let us know. Um, there's restrooms right outside this, uh, the Ryan Lounge, um, and there's more if you go further down the hallway. Okay, so we can start. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us for this exciting event. Um, my name is Leslie Long. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at UMass Boston and the chair of the Social Theory Forum Planning Committee. So we first began brainstorming the themes of this conference two years ago. And during that time, the work of W.E.B. Du Bois has become even more relevant and movements for social and racial justice even more pressing in ways that no one could have predicted. So our schedule includes two full days of panels, a hands-on workshop this afternoon, um, about social justice and activism, and three keynote speakers. Our first speaker, Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste, is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and serves as the director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at UMass Amherst. Her talk today has been sponsored by the organization Sociologists for Women in Society, which has given her a Social Actions Initiative Award um, geared towards promoting feminist scholarship and activism amongst a wider public. This morning, she will employ an intersectional lens to understand the work of Du Bois. And I'll just say a few words of introduction about her work. Um, so Dr. Bella Baptiste, a native of the Bronx, New York, is a scholar and activist who sees the classroom and the campus as a space to engage contemporary issues with the sensibility of the past. Her academic training is in history and historical archeology. span Her research is primarily focused on how the intersection of race, gender, class, and sexuality appear through an archeological lens. Her work ranges from interpreting captive African domestic spaces at Andrew Jackson's Hermitage Plantation to the early history of school segregation in Boston at the Abiel Smith School on Beacon Hill to the W.E.B. Du Bois home site or House of the Black Birth Arts in Great Barrington, Massachusetts to the um, Bahamian island of Eleuthera. So Dr. Battle Baptiste's ability to translate material culture and artifacts into complex interpretations of African-American domestic life has made her a pioneer in her field. Her first book, Black Feminist Archaeology, published by Left Coast Press in 2011, outlines the basic tenets of black feminist thought and research for archaeologists and shows how it can be used to improve contemporary historical archaeology as a whole. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste. So in some places I go, don't actually say anything back, <laughs> which is so not African. <laughs> so I want to say uh, good morning. I thank you all for coming out. Um, it's an interesting way to get here by car. So it, was, it was adventurous. Yeah. Um, last time I was here, it wasn't this much construction. Um, but I do have to say, as someone from UMass Amherst, um, I should say Amherst, just to be radical, but, um, because the age is supposed to be silent. Um, but the view is beautiful. Um, I want to say that I'm just going to give you, I guess what we would call, uh, an anthropologist would call like a trigger warning. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to read from a paper. It's the morning. I'm trying to get you energized. This is about the opening of a conference that's about this person named W.E.B. Du Bois, who I have somehow become completely entwined with, with actually Dr. Morris told me that I now cannot be separated from. Um, but I, so I wanna put that out there. So I'm not gonna read a paper. So we're gonna work with it and then have some time at the end and have some conversation. Because black feminism and Du Bois, how does it fit? Complicated. Um, so first I want to um, thank the, the 12th, the programming committee for the 12th Social Theory Forum, um, especially Leslie Wong for being very patient and persistent to get me here. Um, and then uh, the UMass Boston Department of Sociology, um, and, and, most, and most importantly, the, soci uh, the organization, the Soci Sociologists for Women in Society, 
for the invitation to speak to you today, despite not being a sociologist. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there because I'm an anthropologist, so there's a little bit of I'm here. It's good. <laughs> Anthropology and sociology is like cousins that don't want to acknowledge each other but but use each other all the time. Um, but also um, because um, I happen to be very deep within kind of the study of Du Bois and I like to look at it from the perspective of from the from his archives to his to his artifacts, which to me are not actually separate because as a historical archaeologist, I am I see material culture as a way for us to understand so much of our lives. Uh, I think we neglect the discussion of material culture. When I say material culture, the consumption all around you, your laptops, your coffee cups, your chairs, your clothes, all of that is a defining, a defining aspect of who we are as people. So I feel like archeologists have an unfair advantage because we highlight those with that material, we highlight those artifacts. So how can I talk about Du Bois as a scholar and I am an archeologist, how does that meet? Well, hopefully by the end of this brief conversation, you'll know how and why I do it. <clears throat> So I want to start off by, um, uh, I already started off, but I want to do my next step as giving acknowledgement to my ancestors. Um, the ancestors whose names I know, the ancestors whose names I hope to learn one day, and the ancestors that I might never learn who they are. But because of all of them, it is the reason why I stand before you today. Um, and I think that's very important for us to acknowledge our past in order to talk about our present. So a little bit about the book that, of course, I forgot, I didn't bring it, it's okay. It's on Amazon, everything is on Amazon. Um, but um, I wanna say that uh, because this book was actually, it was three chapters. It was three chapters about three different sites. Um, and, and these sites were kind of the perspective of trying to bring in a black feminist theory to the analysis of the African American past. Uh, specifically, um, I did work at this little plantation um, called the Hermitage, which is Andrew Jackson, who I don't know if you know lately has become very important um, in, the, in the White House. Um, just last week, the, the person elected actually went to the grave of Andrew Jackson and laid a wreath down at his grave. I refused to put a picture of it up, but just take my word for it, it happened. And I had you know, a couple of exchanges about why did that happen? Like, why would he do that? You gotta have somebody to connect with. And who better for this current administration than Andrew Jackson? Just Google it if you don't know all of the stuff that came with this presidency, like banks, Indian removal, um, the first common man president, the one outside of the establishment, the one that was different from everybody else before him. Does it sound familiar? Yeah, okay. So um, the book actually looked at the Hermitage, which was a dissertation site. Then it also looked at a place um, right in Andover, Massachusetts called, uh, it was called originally Black Lucy's Garden. I pushed for the, to call it Lucy Foster's Homestead because her name was Lucy Foster. So I was pushing to understand that this woman born into slavery, free, who all lived in a little house on one acre of land, actually was the beginning and the foundation of how historical archeology span started in this country. So historical archeology span in 1942 and 43 with the Mullins, that was the first African American site that was excavated by archeologists. Um, not, not the promotion of great white men, not Hugh, not Mount Vernon, not Thomas Jefferson and all those problematic folks, but actually an African American site. And so that was, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the history denied right, of, of the where that historical archaeology started from should be a part of the canon. So 
the last bit was, or the last bit, the last chapter was about Du Bois and the Du Bois home site that I had not actually excavated, but was looking through the artifacts and this is what was going to happen. So the book had very good reviews, which as a person who started out as a historian, I really didn't trust because somebody had to slam it. Somebody had to slam it. I think that um, historical archeologists that were reviewing the book um, were actually surprised that they could read the book, not be a black feminist and actually understand it and have it relate to their own work. And that's kind of the gist of what I'm trying to get at and trying to allow you to see um, this morning. But the idea, the one slam I got was from a black male anthropologist at the University of Texas, Austin, where I got my PhD, whatever. Um, and the thing was, the problem of using black feminist archeology span and Du Bois in the same book, like this is a problem. Do we not know about the problematic relationship and the disrespect he had for Ida B. Wells? Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that as we move on, because after sitting down for extensive times with Paula Giddings, who wrote a little book about Ida B. Wells, and um, David Levin Lewis, who is like the uncle I never had, um, and talking with them, realizing that eh, there wasn't a whole lot of overlap, but if we need to create dichotomies, right, we need binaries. We need Booker T. Washington and Du Bois. We can't just have Booker T. Washington and Du Bois. If it was like a Twitter war, <laughs> you know, they would constantly be going at each other, but a lot of that was much more surface than it actually was deep within. And I'm going to talk about that deep within. So as someone who lives in the building where the Du Bois papers um, live, I, I show off a lot and just throw up stuff that other people don't have. But you can all have this because <laughs> it is all digitized um, on Credo for free. Um, and Du Bois would have wanted that way. He would have wanted to be in a public institution and his papers accessible, which we've done. And that other place somewhere around here that he attended, um, they don't have it. So I want to start by saying, um, I want to start by reading a letter, and I'm not going to do a whole lot of lengthy Du Bois quotes because um, that would be cheating. Um, but I want to kind of talk about this particular letter because it struck me. Um, and it was written in July of 1959, and it's to the women of the world. <clears throat> Greetings to women. I have been asked to greet you and I do it gladly, for women have played a great role in my life. My mother, deprived of her husband by the pressure of her well-meaning but narrow-minded family, gave her whole life to me. We were companions. And even when she was lame from overwork and worry, we walked out happily arm in arm. She bore the burden of our poverty nobly. And with a smile, and despite the dark where, where warnings of friends held high her steadfast ideals for me, ignoring the, their fears that I would be spoiled by her faith and hope. My wife of my youth, I'm sorry, the wife of my youth, made me a warm and spotless home, lived faithfully there while I wandered, I emphasize two words, wandered through the world trying to save it. She worshiped our beautiful son, and when the uncurbed sewage of a Georgia city killed him in infancy, she too almost died. Yet lived on to rear our daughter and granddaughter. For 53 years, we lived together until her death. Then came Shirley, Graham, the wife of my age, the faithful companion and helpmate of my last years, sustaining and helping me in my last thoughts and efforts until the time when my granddaughter gave me a great-grandson. Then together, Shirley and I went, searching across the world and found it good. There have been many other women, friends and helpers, in many, in many times and places who worked with me and whom I loved for their belief and sacrifice. 
Why should I not greet them and, and bow humbly before all the women of the world? When I saw that letter, I was like, the more I've been reading about correspondence, the more that like sums up Du Bois's life. Um, and I'm going to talk for the rest of the time now about the contradictions um, and how difficult it is to put labels. As an historian, as a trained historian, as a recovering historian, um, I left history for anthropology, but. I cannot, it, it, it's very hard for me to put my present thoughts on someone who lived so long ago. And that's what I want to caution as well. So I want to talk about this long title. And I appreciate Leslie allowing me to use the whole thing. Because this is a whole sentence. That would have been a doozy of a title. But this is from The Damnation of Women. And I saw this because the two parts about the mothers and mothers of mothers that seem to count, and the fathers who are uh, shadowy memories was so telling because kind of how I came to uh, ask these kinds of uh, questions about Du Bois and feminism, I was so confused about why Du Bois was so Burkhardt-centric. Burkhardt as in his mother's line, because that's who he grew up with. But I wanted to know more about the Du Bois his grandfather, who was born in the Bahamas to uh, a white father and a Bahamian woman, his father, who was born in Haiti to a Haitian woman and uh, Alexander Du Bois. So it was like, for, for me, that was a symbol that Du Bois from his birth was a, dias a son of the diaspora. He was, it, he was, it wasn't just about African America, it was about Du Bois as, in, in the, in, as a place in the world. And why don't we know more about the Du Bois men in his life? Um, hopefully the book will explore that. And it's hard because his, his grandfather um, lived the end of his life and died in um, New Bedford, Mass. And his father died in Hartford, Connecticut. If you, his autobiographies talk about the end of his father in two different ways. Um, du Bois often talked about the fact that he lived as long as he did meant that he could change his, bio, his autobiography. I feel like if you live that long, you can revise your own story. I think that's the um, life goals. Um, but what I want to talk about this contradiction and why it's so hard to, to place Du Bois in one area um, for me right now, um, I see Du Bois being caught between what I'm calling patriarchy and praise. Um, don't use it because it's a chapter in my book. <laughs> I'm glad I got some laughs this morning. Also, by the way, I am sick and I don't know what. So I'm really, this is, I'm, I'm pushing it right here. And I'm trying not to be a mule of the world like Zora called us, but I'm, I'm, I'm pushing through. Um, I wouldn't let down a, a black feminist worldwide, but being sick. Um, oh, thank you. Um, thank you for the, the laughter. So what I want to talk about also in this contradiction is our mythical image of Du Bois. Um, when I first arrived at UMass, I really thought I knew who Du Bois was in terms of this great figure. I thought I had some problems with this whole talented tent thing, um, but I am from the Bronx, but I'm, there's a term that some of us use, it's called Brigetto, and so it's a combination. I'm from the hood, right, the inner city. My friends were from New York City, but as a, as a black woman or a black girl, I was from the inner city. That was interesting. Um, but I, uh, I have bougie tendencies, so when I got to graduate school and I'm trying to figure out capitalism and Marxism and, and how this is, I realized what the conflict within myself was. It was actually to be a socialist trapped in a capitalist body. It's so hard. I feel like I'm a walking contradiction, right? So I'm from the Bronx, but I love country music. It's okay. <laughs> Beyonce did it. So, uh, 
What I'm talking about, and I'm trying to bring up the mythical Du Bois, the Du Bois that we learn about, the Du Bois that we think about, the talented tent, the idea of racial uplift, the idea that he was such a staunch, staunch supporter of women's rights, of women's voices. And I wanna kind of, as we go on this, these two days, um, to kind of think about your own idea of what this mythical Du Bois is in your mind. Because I hope that in some ways, the kinds of interactions that you have and the papers that you listen to and presentations, I, I'm hoping, I guess because this is what you do when you open the conference, right? I'm hoping that you leave with a little bit more of a nuanced understanding of who he was. Because that between that, that conflict between patriarchy and praise is not something that is different from walking through the world black in America. Walking through the world black, walking through the world black, but in America more acutely, right? He talks about a double consciousness. He talks about the idea of living within the veil, but recognizing the veil. This is a man who's talking about contradiction from, the earliest, from his earliest time to the end of his life. He's talking about contradictions. And when you study, when you do African American studies and you, you try to branch out into African diaspora studies, you realize there are so many contradictions. Working in the Bahamas, I was told straight up, the Bahamas is not the Caribbean. I was like, okay, it is on the cruise ship. <laughs> it was so bad. Um, There's a lot about 
Um, as I read more of his correspondence, and I have, I have amazing research assistants, the research assistants are, 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 are women, two women, and they're looking at me like, I'm, I'm, go, I'm confused. And I said, why? They were like, why are his, what he writes and what he publishes, why does it seem so different than his letters? His letters between women, he and women, and I'm not saying they all weren't, they weren't all glossy and nice, and women are everything and great, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of tone in it about his authority on women's issues. He was constantly asked by women's groups to talk about all kinds of things um, because he did, he was outspoken about giving the opportunity, especially in, in, in um, uh, platforms like the crisis, to allow women to write about the issues that they held very dear to them. Du Bois was an advocate for them, yet through his letters, his writings and his letters, um, don't always match. It's it's a contradiction. Um, I, uh, that's Fisk. That's a graduating class. Um, all five of them. 1880, 1886. That's why I love history. I can't. Um, of course, his Harvard uh, moments, which wasn't necessarily his best time. Harvard was a little rough for you if you were black in that era. Um, but. That idea of why do his publications look different than his correspondence. I feel like, isn't that most scholars? I mean, the way you walk and the way you live and the way you write don't always reflect. Here's the catch. If you try to use a black feminist lens and you want to invo invoke the idea of radical black feminism, you know that the political is personal and the personal is political, right? So the separation and that contradiction at least the contradiction must be named and put out, as we say where I'm from, on front street. That means in the open. That was a translation. So, uh, as an example of that contradiction that we found in the archives was him, as early as 1918, he had this really interesting, um, syllabus of talks that he offered for women's organizations. And it was, it was called the uh, Syllabus for Lectures to Colored Girls by W.B. Du Bois. And it's good that he has the prices, because each, for $100, you get eight lectures. Um, but, but look at, first of all, it's for working colored girls. It's not the idea of, this is 1918, it's not the idea that women need to be within the home. He's also understanding the reality because of his relationship with his mother and his concept of her working herself to death. The reason why she was lame is because she had a stroke. And he had to actually supplement the income while they lived in Great Barrington. But here are some of the topics. Earning a living, uh, the necessity of work, the nature of work, kinds of work, income, property, capital, wages, and savings. Apparently those are all separate lectures. Um, the ethics of spending was a, was a, is written here. Um, also, uh, careers to colored girls. This was 12 lectures, so that was $150, because that was a two extra lecture thing. Um, but I thought that this was like modern uh, careers open to colored girls. Modern divisions of labor, or modern divisions of labor, pr uh, present division of, of present division of labor among American Negroes. Farming, sewing, shop and factory, food preparation, clerks and stenographers, merchants, artists and actors, teachers, domestic and personal service, and at the very end is the home. Um, yeah, and then there's the organization of pleasure which is interesting. Um, I'll really quickly read these. It's nine, so it's $125. Um, the philosophy of pleasure, drinking and gambling, physical exercise, music and dancing, social intercourse, travel, theater and lecture, reading and study, recreation and health. So the idea that Du Bois um, thought about women in ways that may not have been typical for his moment um, it's real, and I've got no time left, so I'm going to sum up and show you just a little bit of, um, he wrote fiction, he wrote speculative fiction, he wrote essays, but he also wrote pageants. 
So this was his pageant from the pageant, The Star of Ethiopia, which was very long, it was like five hours. But it was, and it employed like 500 actors. It only happened, I think, about seven times in total, because that's a whole lot of people, and it's a lot of money. Um, but also thinking about the variety of women to represent the race was something that wasn't really a topic that was happening at this time, about 1925. So I just want to point out these amazing little uh, uh, sparks of, 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 not amazing sparks, of these little tidbits from his life. The contradiction is real. I want to end, because I have to, and I want to say that the final question actually is to not figure out an answer to, I hate this question, I really do, was Du Bois a black feminist? If he lived today, would he be a black feminist? I want to say out loud, let's stop that, let's stop doing that, because everyone is gonna disagree. Either he is or he isn't. The funny thing that I, not the funny thing, the, the, the enlightenment that I've had recently, it's not about whether he is a, or isn't a feminist. It is what can black feminists learn from reading his work? What can black feminists learn and take away from his contradictions? How can we use our role as political and personal and then pull that together and, and say that Du Bois does not lose all hope in us, right? I think that there were reasons why he was such a contradiction because we're still talking about him in 2017. How many, there's a lot of scholars that, you know, they go away and that's it. I wish that my stuff was still read when I'm gone for 50 years. And there's not a thing that's happening in the world that you can't find a quote that Du Bois said to relate directly to it. To me, that is brilliant. So as a black feminist that, that sees and reads his patriarchy, I also read the time that he lived in. I understand, I love my grandfather, but I know if I knew him now, I would be like, oh, you are so backward. I know that. And that's okay, because we have to love the contradictions, because as scholars, we have to understand our own contradiction. And so that's what I'm hoping to kind of open up with today, that it's not about putting labels on people, it's about taking the perspectives that you see and then seeing how that author or how that scholar helps you to enhance the understanding of self. <laughs> um, so I want to end right now and um, say that uh, I really appreciate being able to talk about, and I said I wasn't going to go over because there's this timer that's right here, um, but I really, really feel, I don't even want to end with a quote because I read a whole letter, and I just want to say that it was very exciting to think about this in a way that how do I talk about Du Bois to young folks? How do I talk to him about, to a new generation? Um, du Bois is still all over Twitter. I wish he was on Twitter more than um, the person elected. But right now, it's, you know, doing what I do, I really feel that I can talk about these contradictions with young folks and they get it. And the crazy thing is, is that the digitized stuff is there, but when I bring them into the archives and they touch the things, Archaeologists really should rule the world, I'm just saying. Um, but when they touch the material, they feel like they can get with Du Bois. Like, wow, he had one receipt that they were like, he was arguing with the NAACP. He was like, no, you need to pay me. This is what I spent. And, and, and this, is that his handwriting? Like, was he, he sounds angry. And that was like, for the first time, they could see somebody as big as Du Bois as a human being. And so that's how I want to end today. I want us to reflect on our own contradictions and how we can look to Du Bois for inspiration but not have to place him within a box because I think that he's proven time and time again that he cannot be contained in one. Thank you.